Just mention the word patchwork and it will conjure up all sorts of images of brightly coloured garments, quilts, toys and handmade decorations. Usually loaded with nostalgia, patchwork is, by its very nature, a labour of love, and as it uses old scraps of material to create new, you can guarantee that every patch tells a story. For the conservation conscious of the 21st century, patchwork is the ultimate in recycling, but this wonderful craft really was born out of necessity. Today we choose to use patches to sew with, but in times of adversity down through the ages, it was a necessity. For the American pioneers crossing the wild plains in wagon trains, there was no new material to be had, so old fabric had to be reused, often over and over again. Even in more recent times during World War II in Britain, when clothes were rationed, patchwork enjoyed a fashionable revival. So it goes without saying that taking up patchwork will not cost you a fortune to get started. And what's more, as you progress, it won't cost an awful lot more. And you really will be able to produce the most beautiful craftwork to bring you pleasure and satisfaction and delight your family and friends. Despite the great popularity of patchwork today, exactly where and when the craft began has been lost somewhere in the mists of time, but some sources point to patchwork being carried out as early as the Stone Age. This is not to say that early man made wonderfully crafted quilts and bags, far from it. Patchwork was seen as a way of repairing old clothes. When an item of clothing wore out in a specific spot, a new patch of animal skin would be sewn over it so that the garment could carry on being worn and thus the craft of patchwork was created. Sadly, of course, none of these mend and make do garments have survived the ravages of such a very long time. But quite extraordinarily, there have been discoveries of fine bone and ivory needles that are well over 15,000 years old. Throughout the centuries, the essential craft of patchwork began to be rightfully appreciated as more of an art form, and one of the earliest examples of this dates back to around 980 BC. A beautifully adorned patchwork funeral tent canopy was made for an Egyptian queen, sewn from gazelle hides and was covered with dyed serpent motifs, lotus flowers and other traditional symbols. Nevertheless, although patchwork may have been made famous by the women of the world who slaved away to make these wonderful items, in the history books it's the men and on occasion animals that wore the patchwork garments that are remembered. Now war and patchwork may not seem like perfect partners, but many knights from history wore ornate battle garments made out of patchwork. In the 15th century, this was at its most prominent when elaborate battle robes were very definitely the order of the day. Also, it's even been suggested that Joseph's coat of many colours from the Bible could well have been made out of patchwork.
There are plenty of prominent examples of patchwork in history, but none have been more significant to the craft than the work of the women of colonial America. Learning the art of patchwork was a huge part of a young American woman's upbringing, as her education was centred on homemaking and motherhood, rather than formal education. In fact, it was expected that a young girl should have made 12 patchwork quilts before meeting the man she would marry, and then actually create a 13th between the engagement and the wedding. Looking at the work in this modern patchwork quilt that was done by machine, you can only imagine how many hours these girls spent sewing patchwork. Today, thankfully, patchworkers can sew at their own pace and learning the craft couldn't be more relaxed. And to prove the point, we'll show you precisely how it's done. The fundamental tools required are very few because, as we've already heard, patchwork began with scraps of material sewn together. So with a pair of scissors, needle, thread and a bag of old clothes, you really do have all you need to get started. However, if you actually want to take up patchwork to create beautiful works of art, the world, quite literally, is your oyster. The backbone of any patchwork is of course the patches and in point of fact you can patchwork with any fabric with cotton, silk, velvet and even knitting materials used. Nevertheless, a good tip to remember here is that it's best to work with patches of the same material type. For example, try to work with just silk or cotton rather than mixing it up, as it can create a very jumbled and uneven texture and of course give you problems when it comes to washing your patchwork. It's generally accepted that the most suitable fabric for patchwork is firmly woven, opaque cotton, but as you become more confident with your patchwork, you'll be able to experiment with anything you like. Also, many people wash any new fabric before use, as not only will it be easier to work with, but will also ensure that the finished item doesn't shrink. Buying material can be very expensive, especially when you have to purchase large quantities of fabric just to get the one patch that you need. And this is where a good arts and crafts or fabric shop will really come into its own. They will stock the delightfully named Fat Quarters, which are quarter yards of fabric especially cut for use in patchwork and quilting. Fat Quarters usually offer exceptional value for money, and you can also buy bundles in bulk to build your material collection quickly, cheaply and extensively. Next, we'll move on to needles, and as you'll see when you get to your craft shop, patchwork needles are usually smaller than normal hand sewing needles and also have a much sharper point. Try to buy a selection as you'll want to use a size that fits comfortably through all the different materials you'll be using and the finer the needle the better as it leaves less of a hole. A wide choice of thread is also very helpful, so try to have a large number of colours at hand, which will mean you can pick the best one to match, complement or blend into your fabric. Mm -hmm. 
These are the basics covered, but there are a number of other workbox items that you'll find really useful. In an ideal world, keep three specialist pairs of scissors in your patchwork kit, as you will need them to carry out different functions. First of all, a sharp pair of fabric scissors will be essential for cutting material. Then you'll need a good pair of paper cutting scissors for making templates. Do make sure that you don't use your fabric scissors for paper or vice versa as you'll blunt the blades and clean crisp edges to your paper and fabric will make all the difference to your finished result. Lastly, you'll need a pair of embroidery scissors, which will make snipping the ends of the threads and neatening up edges much easier than using larger fabric scissors. Another essential if we're to make a neat edged patchwork is a box of fine pins to secure work while it's sewn together. Glass tipped pins are ideal as they're easier to spot in your craft box and more importantly in your fabric so you'll never forget to remove them. Making sure that all the fabric pieces are the right size is crucial and this is where an accurate template like the one we have here will be essential to make copies of out of paper. Templates can be bought in all manner of different shapes and sizes, but there's nothing wrong with making your own if you can be sufficiently accurate. Just be sure that the shapes are designed so that they can produce a perfectly interconnected tessellating pattern. Last but not least, many patchworkers swear by a thimble to stop any unnecessary pinpricks and whether you use one or not depends on how confident you are with your needlework. It's really important to get your stitches placed perfectly and you can end up with sore fingers so it's worth considering. There'll be plenty of time to move on to producing entire patterns a little later, but for now we'll get to grips with the basics and start stitching together some pieces of patchwork to see how it's done. There are two main methods used for patchwork, known as English and American. It will be helpful to look at both because you'll find that you'll need to change technique depending on what kind of shapes you're working with. We'll begin with the English method as it's the most precise technique and it will stand you in good stead for when we move on to the American method. Using the English method, this is how to make a very simple yet functional rosette placemat. It's produced from seven identical hexagons and here is where our template will come in extremely handy. Some people will draw out seven hexagons onto paper using the template and then cut them out. However, you may find it more accurate if you actually make the hexagon patterns by cutting around the template with a sharp craft knife, as drawing the hexagon and then cutting it doubles your margin of error. It may sound really picky, but accuracy really can't be stressed enough, as the slightest miscalculation in your shapes will cause maddening problems later on as you come to stitch them together and then, after hours of work, 
they won't fit. Now before we move on to cutting the fabric shapes, it's a good time to mention that if you can't get hold of a template, then squared paper is just as good, if not better, sometimes. When using squared paper, simply draw out your design and then cut it out very carefully. An added bonus is the fact that you can mark out which colour fabric goes where so that you can be sure of an aesthetically pleasing finished design. Quite a preamble, but now we have our paper shapes and are all ready to go, it's time to cut out our fabric shapes. You need to cut the fabric slightly larger than the template so you get enough of a turnover. The best thing to do is to pin the template on the back of the fabric to hold it firm and if you have enough fabric to cut out lots at the same time, you can make sure that the grain of the fabric is all facing in the same direction and minimal material is wasted. As you can see here, we've left about a quarter of an inch, that's roughly just over half a centimetre, all around the edge to ensure that the fabric can be folded around the paper comfortably. The next step is to temporarily secure the fabric to the template and to start with you may find it easier to pin first. Then use a large tacking stitch to go all the way around and when you get used to this you'll probably miss out the pinning stage. Very simply stitch all around the hexagon like we're doing here and when you've finished the fabric hexagon should be held very securely by the stitches so remove the pins if you've used them. The method that we've just learned is known as basting, however it's nothing to do with cooking as the name suggests. Basting is the process of using a large running stitch to loosely hold the material together and you'll see this written in a lot of patterns, magazines and needlework books. One tip here is to pay special attention to the corners and keep them as flat as possible, otherwise your finished patchwork will be rather lumpy. Now it's time to start your sewing and this is where the fun begins. Before you start stitching though, place your design on a flat surface so that you can see which one needs to be sewn where. Once you've decided, take two of your hexagons, one being the centre patch and the other will be the first of the edges. Place them very accurately edge to edge so that the paper is facing out and you may also want to pin these together if you feel you can't hold them securely while you're sewing. The stitch that we're going to use to secure the hexagons permanently is called overcasting or over sewing and it's actually very simple indeed. Just remember to keep the stitch as small as possible, which will not only help keep it hidden, but also ensure a really strong bond is made. Start at one end of the hexagon and insert your needle through both shapes. Ideally, you should try to pick up only one or two threads of the fabric of each shape without touching the paper, just as you see here. Even though this is very close to the end of the shapes, it will be secure if you make enough stitches and they do have to be really tiny. Simply carry on over sewing all the way along the hexagon edge until the whole side is fixed. Thank you. 
Our next step is to stitch the other five hexagons all the way around the center shape in just the same way as we did with the first. Only fix the six edges of the center hexagon to begin with. We'll be moving on to sewing the outer shapes to each other in just a moment. But what we need to do before this is remove the running stitch and paper backing from the centre hexagon only. And by doing this, we'll be able to bend the shape more easily, which will make stitching the outer hexagons together a far more pleasant task. Now it's just a matter of sewing all the outer hexagons to their neighbouring shapes, so we create this hexagon flower pattern. To finish the mat, we need to create another patchwork flower that will go on the bottom of the placemat. Again, we can use the same colour scheme, or you can always try something different so that the finished placemat is reversible. With our two stitched flowers all but complete, we can begin to sew them together. All you have to do is place them face to face with the papers on the outside and begin to over sew all the way around the edge. Be careful not to sew all the way around. Make sure you leave a small opening along one side so that it will be possible to turn the placemat inside out when we're finishing it off. You should now be able to remove the running stitch and paper and with a little luck, it will hold itself together nice and securely. Before we turn the placemat inside out, it's a good idea for insulation and aesthetic purposes to add a layer of wadding that is cut to the right shape, making sure it's about a quarter of an inch or six millimetres smaller all the way around. Lightly stitch it to one side of the placemat, ensuring that you only sew it into the overlap edges so that the stitches do not show on the top side of the mat. Once it's secured in place, very carefully turn the mat right side out so that it's now the correct way around. Sew up the small gap with tiny stitches like we're doing here so that you can hardly see the thread and if you follow all these steps you'll just have created your first patchwork product. In a very short space of time, absolutely anybody, seamstress or complete novice alike, can have created a very attractive, unique and inexpensive table mat that will last for years. And of course, as soon as you're ready, make another five to finish off a set of six.
Another shape that's commonly used with the English method of patchwork is a diamond and again the process is very simple. The only difference is that these shapes will tessellate in a different manner. Consequently, plan out your design on some squared paper beforehand, remembering that the diamond is most often used to create a six-pointed star, although many other interesting and intricate designs can be produced with this shape. With the English method swiftly learnt, we can now move on to the American patchwork method, a process that works perfectly with squares and triangles. We'll start off working with squares by making a very simple 3x3 three three patchwork sheet that can be quilted onto a pillowcase when complete. As always, mark out your design on some paper first, as we're using blocks draw out your design on squared paper and work out which colours are to go where. We're going to make our squares about 2 inches, roughly 5 centimetres in size. If you've got a metal or plastic template that's this size then that'll be very handy. If not, you can quickly make a template out of some stiff card. With an embroidery pencil, draw around your template on the back of the cloth like we're doing here. Before you cut them out, it's essential that there's a clearance of about a quarter of an inch or six millimetres in metric all the way around the squares. When you have all your squares cut out and ready to go, there will be three strips of three squares, which can be sewn together to make this sampler. OK, take two squares and place them perfectly back to back and then pin them together so they don't slip or move around at all. We're going to use a tiny running stitch all along one side of the square to sew the two together. Make sure that the needle goes through both of the pencil lines so that they are precisely secured in the same place. When you're at the end of the line, secure the thread by completing a couple of back stitches and this will hold everything firmly in place. You should have two squares secured all along one side. Now all we need to do is secure another square to one side of the squares to complete our first three block strip. When you have a look at the strip from the right side, you'll straight away be able to see how neat it looks. Make the other two strips in the exact same method so that we now have three strips ready to stitch together to make a complete square. The strips are attached to one another in the exact same way as we did with the individual blocks. Place two strips face to face and pin them accurately in place so that the pencil lines are running parallel with each other and all that's left to do next is repeat our tiny running stitches along the pencil lines to attach the two strips to one another. Next, simply attach the third strip and you can complete another piece of patchwork with ease. The American Pieced Patchwork method is used for all manner of designs and once you get the hang of it, it's actually quicker than the English method as there's no need to make templates and stitch them in. 
One good tip is to press out the seams on the wrong side of your patchwork so it lies smoothly if you stitch it onto a backing. It's useful to practice both techniques as you'll be able to create a whole range of patchwork items. Now we've got the basics well and truly covered, it's very much a case of deciding what you want to make out of patchwork and the different designs that are around for you to use. A style that has been used for centuries and is almost the definitive design when you think about patchwork is called Log Cabin. Championed by the many homesteaders of America, the log cabin design is still extremely popular today, most probably due to its ease of production and striking effect. The log cabin is always made up of a number of rectangular blocks and these are used to create different shapes and patterns. And here's how to do it. As before, we'll design our log cabin on a piece of squared graph paper to ensure that we have it all worked out correctly. We're going to make our block an 8 inch square as it's a good size to work with comfortably and produce a sampler big enough to be sewn on a cushion. The finished product that we're aiming for will look like a number of squares, one inside the other, getting larger and larger. For a sampler of this size, we are aiming for one 2-inch centre square, surrounded by three larger squares. We could carefully explain the size of the individual strips around the centre square. However, just by looking at the design here, it's very easy to see how it all works out. Just remember, one side of strips are always the length of the whole square, while the other three sides fit neatly around the smaller square. When it comes to cutting out the fabric, leave a quarter of an inch excess all the way around the blocks so that they can be sewn together neatly. All we have to do now is stitch the sampler together, starting in the centre and working our way out. Once all the bits are secured, you should have a finished patch that looks something like this. A log cabin quilt will consist of many of these blocks, all sewn together to make the larger finished product. As you'll soon discover for yourself, there can be many different designs using log cabin, and they all derive from this one simple method. We haven't really had a chance to touch on the subject of colour matching yet and as our patchwork examples get a little more advanced, it's a good time to mention the importance of colour awareness. It's a great idea to have a look at a colour wheel just to give you a basic understanding of colour theory and how colours can complement or contrast with each other. There is an awful lot written about colour theory, although for now all we need to understand is that certain colours go with one another and others sadly do not. It's generally thought that if you want a strongly contrasting scheme, go for colours that are opposite each other on the colour wheel, and if you wish to have colours that blend well with each other, choose colours that are next to one another on the wheel. This will all come with practice and before you know it, you'll be a veritable expert at colour coordinating your patchwork. As you begin each project, lay your materials in front of you and try to pick a few colours that really complement each other to create the mood that you're after. Here's a really nice design called clamshell and you can really put your colour skills to good use with this style of patchwork. This is a departure from the straight edges we've been looking at because it uses a circular shape 
But don't panic, it isn't difficult with just a little know-how, the shapes fit together perfectly. Clamshell design reverts back to the English method of patchwork to create its effect and therefore uses paper templates. To begin with, you could draw a clamshell template freehand. However, as precision must be absolute in patchwork, it's not such a good idea. You can easily buy one ready-made or download one from the internet. When you've cut out as many clamshells as you want for your design in paper, select a fabric that is nice and pliable. Something that isn't too thick or stiff will make life a lot easier because you are turning the fabric around a curve rather than along a straight line. Place your paper shape on the wrong side of the fabric, pin with a single pin and then cut around, leaving enough edge for a minimal turning. This is one design that you don't want any excess bulk with, so give yourself only what you absolutely need. The next bit is a little tricky, but you should have had plenty of practice by now, so you'll be fine. Just as you did with the hexagons, turn the fabric over, working it to the shape of your clamshell with your fingers. If you want to use more pins, you can, but you will find this easier if you only use the one and let your stitches do the work. It's a bit fiddly, but the result is lovely and well worth the effort. Now we have a number of completed patches ready to stitch and with this design we work from top to bottom. Take care as you stitch in each clamshell to keep the design in line and you'll be pleasantly surprised at how quickly the clamshell design will grow. When complete, you can applique your patchwork piece onto a cushion or anything you like. And of course, with these delightful curves, this clamshell design is particularly enjoyable to quilt. This is really good practice for our next design that's known as Cathedral Window and although it doesn't really fit into either the English or American methods that we've already learnt, it really is worth doing as the end result is truly stunning. We're going to need two different fabrics for this, the first being the backing that creates the borders to our windows and should therefore be a fairly plain colour. The second fabric will be inserted into the windows, so it needs to contrast with the backing material. For our sampler, we'll start off by cutting out four squares of the backing material that measure around about 9 inches or 23 centimetres in metric. They do seem quite large, however it does make it much easier to learn the method with bigger pieces. As always, leave a small seam allowance all the way around and after you've cut them out, Fold it over and hem all four sides neatly with a small running stitch. It's at this point that we need to make sure that our origami skills are up to scratch as there is a fair bit of precision folding required for the cathedral window. Take your first square and make sure that the wrong side is facing you with the front of the material table side down. Now what we need to do is fold all four corners into the middle so that we create a new smaller square. It does sometimes help to press the folds very lightly with your iron to keep them accurate. Now we need to make an even smaller square. So again, 
Fold the four new corners into the centre and also press them lightly. Our new square should measure around about 4 inches, which is roughly 10 centimetres. To secure the square over so neatly through the middle with a single cross stitch that will ensure your square doesn't unfold. Repeat the method for the rest of our larger squares and that's the most complicated step completed. Next, just as we stitched the hexagons together earlier, we need to do the same here, so using tiny stitches sew all four blocks to one another to produce one large 2x2 two two square. Now comes the fun stage where the cathedral window really begins to take shape. We need to cut out smaller two and a quarter inch squares, which is around six centimetres in length from our contrasting material. For our sampler, we only need eight squares and four of these will be cut in half to form triangles for the outer edges. Have a look at our folded square box. You should be able to see that four squares have been created in a diamond shape in the middle of the block. What we need to do now is pin down all four contrasting squares inside as we're doing here to create a diamond. All we have to do now to finish the window is very simply pop over the edges of the folded squares to create the window effect and with tiny stitches hem everything in place. Now just carry on all the way around your window until you have totally framed the colourful centre with the rounded border. For the corners we do exactly the same, except these are only half squares and for the very outside edge just hem the triangle neatly to secure it in place. And there you have it, with just a few simple steps you've created a piece of cathedral window patchwork. Cathedral window is one of those classic designs that people never seem to tire of and it will undoubtedly continue to be just as popular for many years to come. However, there are designs that do seem to go in and out of fashion during particular eras. A method that has enjoyed something of a resurgence in popularity over the last few years is free patchwork which was much loved by Victorian ladies when it was better known as Crazy Patchwork. Crazy Patchwork was a huge phenomenon during Queen Victoria's reign and was so popular with the women of the age that almost everyone was stitching it. Crazy Patchwork even continued as the 20th century dawned and Queen Victoria's long reign came to an end with her death because some tobacco companies cashed in on the phenomenon by placing small scraps of free silk in their cigarette packets to entice people to buy them. Crazy Patchwork found its popularity due to people wanting to make stylish craft items that would also show off their skill with a needle. Today, Free Patchwork has found a new generation of stitchers wanting to see how creative they can be with their patchwork. Many wonderful artworks are produced with this method and the work in progress that we have here shows the superb effects that can be created with it. There really is hardly anything to learn if you want to give free patchwork a try as you'll already have mastered all the techniques you'll need. Nevertheless, 
the one skill that you really must acquire, and it may take some time, is the ability to produce a pleasing composition with the random shapes and colours that you'll be using. Now how you create your piece of patchwork art is entirely up to you. Some people like to use scraps of cloth that are found at the bottom of their material box, while others prefer to buy ready prepared scraps, or in some cases, use a combination of the two. Once you have your scraps, it's just a case of cutting them and tessellating them so that they all fit perfectly together. The simplest method for making a free patchwork is to use the American way to stitch all the pieces together very carefully. But as is the case here, you may prefer to stitch all the random patches onto a backing cloth. Free patchwork, however, goes hand in hand with embroidery and different sewing techniques. As you can see here, the creator of this cushion cover has used some very thick overstitching to really bring out the patches. There are all kinds of stitches you can use, so you can experiment with different coloured threads, yarns and stitch types to create the look that you are after. Free patchwork is one of the greatest variations of the craft as there are no set rules and it allows you to be as creative as you wish. The same principle applies however with all the different patchwork designs and patterns. Give your imagination free reign and see what you can create. Use your graph paper to produce your patterns with different shapes and you won't go far wrong. The interlocking block, which looks like a complex spiralling wave pattern, is in fact only made out of a number of contrasting squares and triangles placed in a certain way. The same goes with the ever so striking wild goose effect that adorns many antique quilts. Wild goose is simply made up of patches like we've created here, which are three triangles sewn together to form a rectangle, and these patches are then joined together to form the complete design. So after you've mastered the traditional techniques, why not give designing your own patchwork styles a go? A method that we've not yet mentioned, even though it goes hand in hand with patchwork, is the process of applique. This is the term for a method of sewing pieces of material on top of your patchwork that are cut out as specific shapes. Most of the time these will not just be particular designs that people add to further embellish their finished patchwork. They can be bought from shops in all manner of designs, from numbers and letters to flowers and animals. If you're feeling particularly adventurous, why not try making your own? Here we're just producing a simple star that will quickly add to a patchwork quilt. Some people even add extra wadding to their appliqued patterns to create a three-dimensional effect. You don't even have to sew these on by hand, and this also goes for almost all the patchwork techniques we have learnt throughout this programme, as more and more people choose to use a sewing machine to complete their artwork. 
This is perfectly acceptable and to be honest a wise move if you're planning on making a 6 foot by 6 foot patchwork quilt as stitching this by hand would take a very long time indeed to complete. Beware though that a sewing machine is only really best suited for straight lines. When stitching curves it's best to do these by hand but of course if you're an expert with your sewing machine then there are no set rules to stop you using it for circles and curvy bits if you want to. Our time enjoying the joys of patchwork is drawing to an end all too swiftly, but we do need to mention the art of quilting, which does go hand in hand with both patchwork and applique. When you've completed a flat piece of patchwork, you can quilt it by adding a layer of wadding and a backing fabric. Pin together and then gently tack a grid so that everything stays where it's supposed to. With a fine needle and thread of your choice, you can go on to pick out any shapes you like within the patchwork in a very small, neat quilting stitch, which is a very even running stitch in miniature. The effect is beautiful and will make your piece of sewing very tactile indeed. There is, however, much more to quilting than this, and if you get hooked on patchwork, you'll definitely want to find out more. And on that very positive note, this programme on Patchwork really has come to an end. Hopefully, you'll have been inspired to rummage through your fabrics and try your hand at this very traditional form of recycling. Whether you want to work with precision or freehand, Patchwork has something to please every taste and of course, if you can ever bear to part with any of your masterpieces, they will make wonderfully personal gifts for your nearest and dearest. Start small and your patchwork projects will quickly grow, especially if you join forces with other patchworkers for a bit of social stitching, which will prove to be one of the greatest joys this incredible craft has to offer. <laughs>